I really have a strong conviction that we need in our apologetics to be increasingly Christ-centered and Christ-focused. Not only in our apologetics, in our preaching, in our pastoral care, uh, in everything that we do. Christ is the center of our faith. Now, when we're thinking about apologetics, you could think about the uniqueness of Christianity. And I know that from a European perspective, sometimes it feels like Christianity is disappearing or declining or has lost influence. But it's really quite helpful to remember that one third of the world's population identify as Christian. Lots of questions, of course, about what they mean when they say that, but it is still an amazing figure. An unparalleled influence on global values. One of the things we can do when we're talking to people is to say to them, well, you believe in fairness and equality. So do I. But I'm, I'm interested, why do you believe in that? Most likely they'll say, because obviously it's good and it's right. And you'll say, but is it really so obvious? How come some other people in the world don't believe it? And how come in the old days in Europe, people didn't believe it back in the Roman Empire? They had gladiator contests, people killing each other for fun. They had a, you know, you abandon a baby if it's disabled and just leave it out in the rubbish uh, heap. What changed? Christianity. It was the gospel that changed Europe and it gave us human rights. The idea of the, the rights of each individual came from Christianity. It gave us the foundation of law. It gave us ethics. It gave us education and health. I'm sure this is true in many countries, but if you go to London um, uh, on that other continent west of Europe, that little one <laughs> called um, Great Britain, uh, you will find that the big hospitals there are called St. Bartholomew's, St. Thomas's. Why? Because they started as monasteries and, and they, they were handed over eventually to the state. It was Christians who started healthcare and education. The universities were founded to give education to ministers or priests. So, so we, we have to have confidence that although Christians and the church have done many bad things that do not reflect Jesus, I do think it is fair to say historically that Christianity has given more good to the world than bad, including many of the things people still see as good. So you could read someone like Tom Holland and his book Dominion. Uh, there are others who are writing on that as well, but saying that this is where so many of our values that we want to hold on to came from. Of course, it's a big question for Europe. Can Europe maintain those values without a foundation, a worldview that they came from? And so we might think, I mean, people will tell you, oh, of course we can keep those things. But in a sense, Europe is performing an experiment and we don't know how that will turn out. And I suspect that many of those values will become more and more questioned uh, and challenged as we move away from a foundation for them. But anyway, we could talk about that. <laughs> we could talk about the uniquely historical source of Christianity. Why should we trust the Bible? Look at the, the quantity of manuscripts that are available, uh, unparalleled in any ancient source. Look at how reliably they've been transmitted over time. Uh, look at, at the early statements that you have, the very earliest parts of the New Testament. For example, 1 Corinthians, one of the very first books. And what does it say? That Jesus rose again. And if, our, if that didn't happen, our faith is in vain. It's even earlier than the, than the Gospels, okay? Right from the very beginning. So that is unique. And it's unique, I mean, all of these things are unique compared to other religions in the world. No other religion can claim to have a, a historical source of that reliability. They're, the only one that maybe will, will try to make that claim is Islam. And I think there are reasons that if you look into that as to the source of the Quran, uh, I think there are reasons to question that. Although I think, it, yes, at least you can say there are some things there that came from close to the time of Muhammad. Uh, but for Christianity, you don't just have one source, one book. You have several sources, several books, four gospels. God has given us so much that is reinforcing that line of argument. 
66 books of the Bible as an integrative whole, a meta-narrative, a big story that runs from Genesis to Revelation that makes sense. And it makes sense not only within itself, but it makes sense of the world that we live in. And you don't have to put your hand up. You're all too tired to do that now. But God rules. We rebelled. God rescues. We respond. God restores. That's the story of the Bible as well. Genesis 1 and 2, Genesis 3, the whole Old Testament and the Gospels, the book of Acts and the epistles telling us the response and some of the restoration and revelation opening up the fullness of that restoration. A unique integrative whole that, again, no other religion has a source like that, scriptures like that. In, in Hinduism, they have scriptures, but modern Hinduism is vastly different from those scriptures. So they revere them, but those scriptures are largely about sacrifices and incantations and spells. Modern Hinduism doesn't use those things. Or you can talk about Islam and the Quran. And the Quran, as I have tried to read it in English, I don't read it in Arabic, but in English certainly, it's, it's like some parts of the Bible mostly like the wisdom literature, like a collection of sayings or thoughts, some a little bit like Psalms, but it, and some references to stories, but not complete stories and not a complete meta-narrative. It is very different. We could think, of course, about the unique view of God in Christianity. No other faith, no other belief system on earth believes in God the God that we believe in. Now, these, each one of these points you could turn into a, a whole apologetics talk and maybe in an advanced network you'll look into some of those in detail. You might have some questions about them afterwards and that's also fine. But why do we have a unique view of God? Or what is, what is unique about the Christian view of God? So, um, we are talking about God revealed in Jesus Christ, and that is very important. Because when you have a conversation with someone and they are talking about God, just in the abstract, what do they mean? Who is this God? We, we as Christians cannot talk about God without thinking about God revealed in Jesus Christ. Why? Because yes, God is revealed in the scriptures, of course, but how is he supremely revealed in the person of Jesus? We only get the full revelation through, through Christ. That is not to diminish the Old Testament at all. It's also true. It's inspired by God. It's reliable. But if we want to talk about God, we need to, to talk about God as revealed in Jesus. And God is revealed in Jesus. Not only in, uh, in Jesus do we see that he is a covenant maker, but he is the triune covenant maker. We don't really get the Trinity, Father, Son, and Spirit, until we hear Jesus. The reason as Christians we believe in the Trinity is because Jesus spoke about his Father and about the, the Spirit. And yes, the rest of the New Testament does too, but it begins with him. You don't get it clearly. You get glimpses of it in the Old Testament, but not clearly. Uh, Hebrews 8 the new covenant, quoting from Jeremiah 31. It tells us about the nature of the covenant that God has made with us. Now, why am I emphasizing covenant? Because this is a God who, who makes a binding relationship based on promises to people and who binds himself to his people. Do you see that? Here again is the transcendent, sovereign God, but who is also imminent and involved. This is not the God of Islam. The God of Islam would never make a covenant because to make a covenant would diminish the God of Islam. And in many ways, the Islamic vision of God is, you can see the influences of, of, of Greek philosophy that also influenced Christian thinking, but they didn't, they didn't get that back. They didn't get back to a Christian understanding. They have this idea that God, God is, is too great to bind himself to people. There is no promise of salvation. You can hope for salvation, but you cannot presume upon it. There is no promise. God is not bound to people. So what do we see in Hebrews 8? 
what do we see in the Trinity? We see the eternal Father, the incarnate Son, and the indwelling Spirit. The eternal Father, the new covenant says, three promises, they will all know me from the least to the greatest. The fatherhood of God, that is uniquely, distinctively Christian. Why do we know that we can talk to God as Father? Because Jesus taught us to pray, Our Father. Isa Masi, Al Masi said, Pray to God as Father. For many Jewish people, for Muslim people, that concept is not there. But Christians know that we talk to God as Father. It's a precious thing. The incarnate Son, their sins and their iniquities, I will remember no more, the new covenant says. That Jesus brings complete forgiveness through his sacrificial death. And that again, of course, in Islam, the death of Jesus is denied because again, this would be beneath a prophet as great as Jesus. For modern Judaism, you, you have no sacrificial system. They don't practice that. They don't have the temple and the sacrifices anymore. But we have the fulfillment. We don't have them anymore because we have the fulfillment of them. And the indwelling spirit, I will write there my laws on their hearts and on their mind. That's uh, definitely speaking about the work of the spirit. Read 2 Corinthians 3 and you'll see that Paul picks up that language. Transformed internally by his empowering presence. Distinctively Christian. That God is not only with us or near us. We saw in Acts 17 that in him you live and move and have your breathing, transcendent and imminent. But God for the believer is in us. We are in Christ and through the Holy Spirit, Christ is in us. Now, these are distinctively Christian truths. So keeping Christ central, what I really want to say is that we need to keep Jesus at the center. He needs to be at the center of our devotion, at the center of our theology at the center of our apologetics. The Apostle Paul, I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Yes, he goes on to talk about the resurrection in chapter 15, but this is Jesus at the very center. What we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord with ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. And apologists, John Stackhouse says, humble apologetics, will want to focus upon the claims Christians have made about Jesus rather than abstractions about religion, theism, or even Christianity. The particular claims about Jesus lie at the heart of the matter. We're not interested in making theists unless it's a step towards making a Christian. You know, we, we don't want to just win arguments about the existence of God or about well, which religion is more influential and better. We need to get to the person of Jesus. Again, Stackhouse says, and this is, I find, very helpful when we think about other religions. The question of Christianity and other religions takes on a different color when it shifts to Jesus and other religious leaders. Notice that. Christianity may look more or less like other world religions in many generic respects. Christianity offers salvation, as do others. Christianity teaches high moral values, as do others. Buddhism has 10 commandments, which are quite similar to Christian commandments. That shouldn't surprise us. People can recognize what is good under the sun. Christianity encourages regard for the neighbor as do others. But Jesus himself does not look like every other religious leader. No other such figure is said to be God incarnate. No other suffers for the sins of the world no other rises from the dead as the firstborn of a general resurrection to come, and so on. So the more we look at Jesus, the more comparisons with other religions come into focus. So you will hear people say, oh, all religions are the same. They're all teaching morality. They all teach love. I mean, some of those things you can challenge on their own grounds. They all teach love? Really? Love for who? What kind of love? How do you define that love? Well, again, as a Christian, how would you answer those questions? You can only say what love is and who we should love by looking at Jesus. Who did he love? His enemies. How did he love? By laying down his life for them. Yeah, that's a different definition of love than in any other religion. 
So what is unique about Christ when compared with other religious leaders? Let's, let's go through, and you can, you can give me some ideas as, as we do this. But his unique status, Jesus is born in poverty. He's not born in a palace like the Buddha. And I'm going to talk at times about Muhammad and about the Buddha because uh, those are two personal founders of religions. But the Buddha is born in a palace. Muhammad, uh, yes, had some disadvantage in life, but he was part of a wealthy clan and had the opportunity of being adopted, if I understand correctly, by, uh, and living in a merchant community. Jesus is born in obscurity in poverty. He shunned power. He turned away from power when that was offered. Now, you could say the Buddha did that. He left the palace as well, but other religious leaders have not. He lived a fulfilled life. You know, when you read about Jesus, he is attractive as a character. He is so sorted. We would say today, he's got it all together, right? He knows what he's about. He is confident, but never arrogant. He died rejected. Yeah? Who else can you say that about? Uh, Muhammad died in, as an old man. The Buddha died as an old man uh, as well. Jesus dies as a young man rejected. Even just as a story, it's compelling. It's attractive as a personality. If you could get someone to read about him or watch a film about him, it's very hard for people to deny there is something about this man. So we have already said about his teaching, you could look at his ethics, whatever you wish others would do to you, do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets, the golden rule, do to others as you would have them do to you. Now, someone will say, but oh, many religions have the golden rule, but they don't. If you look at the history of this, when people say that, and they talk about Confucius had this rule and other religions before Jesus had this rule, what the rule that they had is this. It's do not do to others what you don't want them to do to you, which is a great rule. But it's a rule that just leaves you to say, you keep out of my space and I'll keep out of your space. <laughs> and maybe I might do something nice to you occasionally, but I don't have any duty to do something good to you as long as I don't harm you. In medical ethics, we say first do no harm. It's a great first rule, but it's not a great last rule, okay? What Jesus does is to turn it around and say, it's effectively, it's like it's not enough that you just don't harm people. You've got to do to others what you would like them to do to you, even when they haven't done it. This is so radical that some non-Christian thinkers have looked at that and said, you know, Jesus wasn't really a great teacher at all because his teaching is impossible. <laughs> and they're right. It is impossible, humanly speaking. But with God, the impossible is possible. It's only possible with the transformation of the heart. There is a unique backstory to Jesus' teaching. He, he, he said, don't think I've come to abolish the scriptures that came before me, but to fulfill them. That's really important. Because when we think about a God who dies, this is not just some person who said, I am God, I know you've never heard of God before, but here I am and I'm going to die. This is the God of the Old Testament. This is the one who is fulfilling the Old Testament. The whole backstory tells you, what did the Apostle Paul say? Christ died for your sins according to the Scriptures and rose again according to the Scriptures. There is a backstory. You don't get that with the Buddha. You don't get it with Muhammad. You don't get this with other religious leaders. They appear from nowhere. They say they have some truth that they discovered inside themselves or maybe from God. But Jesus is not like that. He's fulfilling a whole centuries of revelation. And he talked about the kingdom of God in unique terms. The rule of God that we can enter through faith in him. A righteousness that exceeds the righteousness of the best religious people around him. Again, impossible standard, and the whole point is it's impossible without transformation through him. We could think about his actions, loving friend of sinners, again, grace and truth together, never, never ignoring sin, but always loving people, mighty 
worker of miracles. Who else can you say that about? The Buddha is supposed to have done miraculous things, but there are things like levitating or making multiple copies of himself, kind of party tricks, if I can say that. They're not achieving anything good. Uh, Muhammad, there is no record of any miracle. Muslims will say the Quran was his miracle, but even the Quran says that Jesus performed miracles. Uh, and, and he is a mighty miracle worker, showing authority over creation, over every aspect. They were filled with great fear and said, who is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? Do you not believe, Jesus said, that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words I say do not speak on my own authority. I don't speak on my own authority. The Father does his works. Believe me that I am in the Father, the Father is in me, or else believe in a kind of the works themselves. And unique claims, God incarnate, Lord and judge of all. And again, for many Muslims, they believe that Jesus will return again, and he will be the agent of judgment. So you get these ideas that are still there, but that only really makes sense if he is God. Who else can judge? Who else is utterly good and righteous, but Jesus will return, and he taught that as, as judge. No one else could credibly make that claim. Here is Jesus, the only person in history who can make a claim to be the creator God, not just an avatar of God, like in Hinduism, or not just an aspect of God, or a particularly God-like person, but the creator God, no one else can do it and make it credible because only Jesus did the things that show that he was that. And so you're probably familiar with C.S. Lewis's argument, the trilemma, uh, was Jesus God? We'll come to the trilemma in a moment, but I referenced it on the previous screen. Christians claimed it from the very start. Be confident. You look at the gospel. You look at the epistles, including 1 Peter 3 that we saw in one of the other talks, so many references applying the Old Testament to Jesus. And you look at Revelation, he is the Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. The same words are used about God uh, in the Revelation. And Jesus claimed it. He substantiated it through his actions, divine authority over nature, disease, demons, death, and even sin. And he accepted worship as God. And Christians have worshipped God from the very beginning, or worshipped Jesus, rather, from the very beginning. That doesn't make sense in a Jewish background unless he is God. You don't worship anyone except God. So even though you can say it was a little bit later that the creeds kind of nailed it and ironed out the question exactly in what sense is, is Jesus God and how does he relate to the Father, th there was no question that the worship of the church from the very beginning was directed towards Jesus. So they maybe didn't, hadn't thought it through philosophically or as a theological statement, but they saw the truth of it and they responded to that. And so C.S. Lewis said, I, I'm trying to prevent someone saying the foolish thing that people often say about Jesus. I'm ready to accept him as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. That's the one thing we mustn't say. Either this man was and is the son of God or else a madman or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool, you can spit at him and kill him as a demon, or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God, but let us not come with any patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teaching. He is not a teacher. He has not left that open to us. He didn't intend to. And actually, as I said earlier, if he was just a human teacher, he wasn't a good one <laughs> because he called people to something impossible. Yeah? He called people to something impossible. You can't live the way Jesus taught us to live uh, without the power of God. <laughs> okay, so a human teacher alone will not take, try to stretch you to a place you cannot go. Okay? He is God come down and made known. You, you'll get these pictures of, you know, how do people know about God? The, the, the mountain with all the roads reading to the top, leading to the top. Have you come across that? All roads lead to God. The problem with that, of course, is if you're standing at the bottom of the mountain, how could you possibly know that all roads lead to the top? Where do you need to be to see that all the roads lead to the top? 
probably even above the top, right? Because even if you're at the top, you can't really see. You need to be somewhere up here looking down with a drone or whatever. In other words, you need to be above God, right? And actually, it's a very arrogant claim. I'm not saying you say to someone, that's really arrogant, but you say, wow. Somebody says all roads lead to God. Really? How do you know that? (laughs) Reveal this to me. Tell me. That's a bold claim to make. Jesus said, I came down from the Father. What if someone came down from the top and entered the world and I'm leaving the world and going back to the Father? Or the blind men and the elephant, you know that one? They're all feeling different aspects of God. Every religion has some truth and we're just feeling a little bit and you might feel the tail or the leg or the the trunk or the tusk. Well, That would be true if religion was just made by people based on experiences of God. But Jesus says, no one has ever seen God, but the one and only Son, who is himself God and is in closest relationship with the Father, has made him known. Yeah? Here is God revealing himself fully to us. The incarnation is unique. In Hinduism, you have ideas of avatars of God, usually shown in blue. You might have seen a movie that does the same thing. Um, But they are not really human beings. It's kind of living for a time to achieve some purpose. Or you had Zeus who came down to earth occasionally, sometimes usually, I think, to make someone pregnant and then go back, okay? But, But this is not temporary. When did Jesus stop being human? He hasn't. He hasn't. The the, the Christian incarnation, the miracle is not just that God became human and not any God, not a God who is part of nature or a reflection of part of nature, the creator who is apart from nature. That's miraculous enough, but even that is not the full extent. He is permanently human. This is a permanent union of God and humanity. So is Christianity anthropocentric? Well, it's theocentric, it is God-centered, but because Jesus is God and man, you can say that he is fully God and fully man forever. You can say it is anthropo, no, theo-anthropocentric, or you could just say it's Christocentric. Christ is the center, and in him, humanity finds its proper purpose and fulfillment, and so does God's purpose find its completion. His unique death, A young man in shame and pain, claiming to be for others. The Son of Man, he said, didn't come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Or when he broke bread and shared wine with his disciples and he said, my blood, this is my blood that is shed for for you for the forgiveness of sins. Don't forget, Jesus told us why he was dying. It's not just a random event. It's an event full of significance, fulfilling the Old Testament, the sacrifice, and of course, a unique resurrection. This Jesus God raised up, and of that we're all witnesses. Peter, of this he's given assurance to all by raising him from the dead, Paul in Athens, as we saw, or as Paul writes in Romans, he's declared to be the Son of God in power according to the spirit of holiness by his resurrection from the dead. The preaching of the early church so often centered on on the resurrection. Yes, Jesus crucified, you can't have a resurrection without it, but but the resurrection is this transforming truth. If Christ has not been raised, our preaching is in vain, your faith is in vain. So don't be shy about talking about the resurrection. Yes, lots of people will say you're just nuts like they did in Athens, but work with them. Build trust with them to a point where you can show them that actually Jesus really died. This evidence is is clear in Scripture because he really died. The tomb was empty. There were many witnesses. The disciples were transformed. What else could do that? And skeptics were transformed. Thomas and Paul or Saul. And Christianity spread in the face of opposition. What else could explain that? It's a valid question. If somebody wants to say to you, Jesus didn't rise again, well, why do you think Christianity took hold? Probably they haven't really thought about that. But I don't think there's any other explanation. And notice this. 
we were in a meeting recently where one of the others involved in the center said uh, that, quoting another scholar, that there is no one else in history, I said earlier, who could make a credible claim to be God. And there is no one else in history where there is credible historical evidence that they came back from the dead. Is it just coincidence that it's the same person? <laughs> so people try to do the statistics to say, what are the chances of one man being able to do all that stuff and one man rising from the dead? Imagine putting those together. It's such a strong case. So what? What difference does this make? Jesus made it very clear. No one comes to the Father except through him, the exclusive Christ. Salvation is found in no one else, Peter says in Acts. God exalted him to the highest place and every knee should bow in heaven and on earth, Paul writes to the Philippians. We know the Son of God has come and has given us understanding so that we may know him who is true. And we are in him who is true by being in his Son, Jesus Christ. He is the true God and eternal life. Notice the relationship with truth. I said it the other day, you're not trying to convince people of an intellectual system. You are inviting people into relationship with the living God through Jesus, who is true. You're not trying to convince them of the truth. You are trying to bring them to the one who is true, who is the truth. You're not trying to give them a slightly different way to live. You're trying to bring them to the one who is the way. You're not trying to just improve their life a little bit. You're trying to bring them to the one who is the life. Have confidence in Jesus. And when we put Jesus with other worldviews, we find he doesn't fit in any worldview other than the gospel worldview in which he is the center. Remember, the hand right at the center, Jesus. God rescued. You try to put him into any other worldview and that worldview will begin to bend around him. He's like the, the sun around which the planets must rotate or what do you call that? Orbit, that's the word. <laughs> yeah. Oh, there, hey, that's an unhelpful advert in the middle. Are you getting shares or whatever? No, no. <laughs> but orbit's the word. So, so, yeah, you cannot have Jesus, the real Jesus, without everything else being shaped by him, yeah? He is so magnetic. He is so massive, so such a big mass that everything else will be drawn to him. And he fulfills the longings and hopes of every worldview. Every worldview has hopes, has longings. And Jesus is the true fulfillment. That's what the apostles show in Acts. What you are really longing for is him. What your religion is trying to grasp out in the dark for is really him. And he also exposes their idolatry and lies. You realize that the other things that get worshipped or trusted in or are, are nothing compared to him. When we bring Jesus into apologetic questions, everything changes too. How can you believe God exists? Why does God leave evil unpunished? Why does God allow such suffering? Why do you trust the Bible? How can Christians think their religion is the only right one? Is God anti-gay? How could a good God send people to hell? What happens if you put Jesus into those questions? How can you believe Jesus is God? It's a question I'd much rather answer, isn't it? How do I believe God exists? Well, Jesus believed God. In fact, Jesus actually said he was God. <laughs> so why do I believe that? I'd rather have that conversation. Why does God leave evil unpunished? How could a good man like Jesus be so compassionate to bad people? It's an even bigger problem, isn't it? I mean, not, not flip it around. The amazing thing about Jesus is not that he went around punishing people, but that he was so kind to terrible people. And who is bad and who is good? Why does God allow such suffering? Why did Jesus suffer? Again, not a God who is distant from suffering, but involved in feeling it and suffering for our salvation. How can you trust the Bible? Why did Jesus trust the Bible? Because he did. 
How can Christians think their religion is the only right one? How could Jesus claim to be the only way to God? Is God anti-gay? Was Jesus anti-anyone? Not as far as I can see. He did have issues with the things people did, but he wasn't anti-people. How could a good God send people to hell? How could Jesus speak so much about hell? And he did. In very clear terms. We're presenting Jesus who is the stone of refuge and the stone on which people stumble. We want him to be the only offense. Remember, he will be a sanctuary and a stone of offense and a rock of stumbling. That's what we're called to. Present Jesus. Bring the questions to Jesus. My one simple rule for apologetic conversations, which I didn't say when we talked about it for First Peter 3, but the most basic rule that you must remember always is get to Jesus as quickly as you can without losing them. <laughs> okay? Get to Jesus. Bring them to Jesus. Bring Jesus into the picture because Jesus will bend the questions, will, will change the framing of it, will draw people to himself if he is lifted up, presented, lifted up on the cross, and lift it up and magnified as we worship him in conversation with others. Apologetics is pastoral care for the mind. I think was it Stefan said that. Apologetics is worship. Apologetics is public worship. <laughs> yeah? And like we said, you don't just talk about Jesus in the abstract. You worship him. You show people that you love him. And therefore, if you want to be a good apologist, the most important thing that you can do is worship Jesus, right? because that will give you courage and boldness and humility and gentleness. And you can present him who is the truth.